speaker of this first session. That is Paul Kent from uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, who's going to talk about irradiating quantum Monte Carlo for exascale. Good morning. Uh, can you just confirm that you can see the slides? And we definitely okay? can see your slides and we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And let me start by thanking the organizers for the chance to present and for putting this uh, workshop uh, together. I'm really looking forward to it. So as I said in the introduction, I'm going to talk about you know, our work moving Quantum Monte Carlo and the QMC pack code uh, towards uh, ANXA scale. Uh, and then when I looked at the um, agenda and learned that we had a you know, number of uh, registered uh, undergrad and graduate students, I also thought uh, it would be important to talk about this additional topic because it, it can get neglected. So this, um, this is a particular focus, um, the importance of the software architecture. And of course the take home message is to make sure that we all, to remind everyone to pay sufficient attention to this, because unless we have the appropriate uh, data placement uh, algorithms, uh, no matter what uh, particular toolkit we use to express those, uh, we are not going to be able to get high performance on these future architectures. And we'll also have challenges around code maintainability. So we need to pay big attention to software architecture. So just a note on the outline here, I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges in high performance computing and some of the same points that Jack touched upon. Uh, and then walk through some of our experiences and analysis with Quantum Monte Carlo and the QMC pack code, uh, you know, evaluating various uh, options. And I you know, hope by the end, when I have a summary and I talk about some recommendations, I'll have presented enough information to have some uh, buy-in uh, from uh, the audience. Just uh, by way of acknowledgments, actually, as, as Jack uh, hinted, uh, much of this work was done in the context of the DOE-funded Exascale um, computing project. You can see uh, the uh, QMC pack uh, ECP team there from a couple of years ago at our last uh, in-hands uh, meeting. Uh, hopefully, we'll be meeting in person again uh, you know, sometime uh, next year. So this is out of date, but it's, it's the last one we have. And I particularly want to thank uh, Yalo from Argon, who's going to be actually presenting later in this workshop, and also Peter Doak at Oak Ridge uh, for all of the conversations, ideas, and implementation that go into this. So the first thing I really want to note is just the, you know, the scope of the challenge that all our different applications face, because the, you know, the range of HPC hardware that we're being asked to, to run on and do productive science is really diversifying. Uh, so this is an exciting time, but of course it's also a challenging time. Uh, so you know, I have an example of various uh, you know architectures we might be asked to uh, run on here. So we have, and also let's not forget, right? Traditional CPUs, you know, continue to change, so they are gaining specialized features, for example, matrix multiply operations, and at the same time, GPUs are becoming more general. So already for a couple of years, it's been possible to write a more or less self-hosting application on NVIDIA GPUs and avoid the hassle of going back to the CPU, possibly getting much more performance, sort of as Gromax does in its current release. And then of course, at the same time, and we've all heard this, right, there's this huge growth in uh, machine learning uh, accelerators. Uh, there are also field programmable gate arrays still out there. And, uh, you know, NEC will sell us a vector accelerator card, still very interesting. And of course, we've all heard about the advances in quantum. Perhaps we'll have a quantum accelerator that we need to talk to uh, before too long. And this is not just an academic listening. So for ex listing, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, Alex Tom's group uh, in England ported variational Monte Carlo to FPGAs. And they got very nice, not only uh, speed ups, but importantly, energy efficiency improvements. And of course, that's what's driving a lot of this. Now, if we think about what are the, the key features of most of these, well, of course, first, and this really affects how we write the applications, is that data movement is one of the slowest things we can do. So choosing appropriately where our data is and then having the right algorithms for the memory hierarchies, whatever they happen to be, is very important. 
And then we mustn't forget just the scale of even you know, the current hardware that we're asked to run on. If one looks at the data sheets for the accelerators at the top, we see that they um, have you know, thousands of, of compute elements of, of some name. And one needs something like 10,000 floating point operations um, they, you know, at once on these uh, processors. And so then allowing for pipelining additional overheads, we might need to have you know, an operation of the order of a million floating point uh, operations going through really to have a chance of running at high efficiency. So that's a big challenge to our uh, applications. Uh, and I wanna give an example now from actually a different field uh, that I was involved in uh, earlier in, in, in my career. Hopefully this is an area where people don't have too much uh, uh, emotions at stake. And this is from uh, CERN. This is the Geom4 uh, detector simulation tool. This is from high energy physics. And what it is, it's a software package that lets you describe uh, detectors or indeed models of the uh, International Space Station or a voxelized uh, human for medical physics applications. And what you can then do is you give it an initial set of particles and it tracks them through the detector keeping track of uh, you know, where energy is deposited, where particle decays occur and, and so on. So you can use this to design detectors and see what would happen if different uh, fit laws of physics were at play. So this is very widely used. It's got tens of thousands of citations. And uh, unfortunately, this is very challenging to port to new architectures. So I'm showing here actually the current source code and you can see some of the people are responsible for this about you know, 25 years ago now. And this is the class called G4 Navigator that you call to say, where am I in the detector? And then if I'm going in a particular direction, what am I going to hit next? This is one of the most fundamental operations uh, in the simulation. And unfortunately, uh, younger me, when he was working on this um, code, you know, wrote this in terms of tracking one particle at a time. So even though you're going to do millions of, of these to get in a statistical simulation, this then means it's going to be very hard to find, you know, enough factorization, let alone support to a GPU. And of course, there's thousands of lines of code uh, underneath this. And then even if we can think to make the geometry infinitely fast. I'm sure everyone in the audience has got some ideas on how we could do this. You then have to accelerate all the physics packages. So just dropping in whatever the current popular tools are to accelerate this code isn't going to get uh, very far. So we need to be prepared to make large changes. Now, fortunately, I think we can actually celebrate uh, a lot of the success done in the electronic structure community, actually. So I went back in my files. Uh, this is a copy of uh, PWSCF from uh, 1997. And here we have the iterative solution of the eigenvalue problem. And so you evaluate Hamiltonians and orbitals, uh, and so on. So I guess this is uh, Davidson uh, at the time. And actually, if we look in the uh, current code, you know, the the same routine roughly is still there, but we see there's been a huge amount of work done with MPI parallelization, blocking, and so on. And we're gonna see more of this, I think, in the presentation uh, later in the workshop. So why do we have more scope for optimism? Well, of course, we've got lots of plane waves and orbitals to operate on. So there's a bit less need to re-architect. So I think we should celebrate that you know, this work is uh, able to be, uh, to be done. And one thing I would also note, um, there are many more electronic structure codes than there are energy physics um, simulation codes. So there's also much more potential to share solutions uh, in the community. And so that's something we should um, encourage and celebrate as well. So this is notionally, I talk about quantum Monte Carlo and quantum Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so just a quick introduction uh, to what they are. Um, so quantum Monte Carlo is just a big umbrella name for methods that solve Schrodinger's equation uh, stochastically. And the reason they're interesting is that they are very, very accurate uh, out of the box in the sort of the standard ways you run them today. And uh, we and other groups have shown fairly recently that actually that all the approximations in them, and there's only a couple, um, can both be tested and systematically reduced, at least in a simple enough system. So you have potential for a convergent uh, method here. And so you can treat metals, uh, we've added spin orbit recently. And of course, uh, this is going to be an expensive calculation because we're 
asking a difficult question. So it's going to cost us more. But of course, that also makes it in principle well suited for high performance uh, computing. So an example of equation that might be solved is the uh, imaginary time Schrodinger's equation. And if you propagate this out in, in time, you exponentially lose the high energy states, get the ground state uh, solution from which you can then compute properties. And this potentially can be very uh, accurate. And you see here some applications. So 2D germanium uh, selenide this year. And actually I went back you know, already a few years ago, calculations of diffusion barriers in transition metal oxide super lattices. So something you might previously have thought to only be done with the DFT can actually be done with quantum Monte Carlo in some cases. Now, what do they look like internally? What do they sort of feel like? Well, to me, they always feel like a cross between a classical molecular dynamics code because we're pushing particles. So in this case, particles are electrons and you need to have neighbor lists to compute distances between pairs of electrons and electrons and atoms. And then you also have basis set operations and linear algebra. So it feels a bit like an electronic structure code uh, at the same time. I'm talking about the, uh, all our efforts in the QMC pack code. And I just like to stress everything is open source and up on the GitHub. Uh, you can see some of the technologies we use uh, here. So we're a C++ code. And one thing I'd note for anyone who's interested in learning more about these, actually, we just did an eight week virtual workshop. So a similar period of time to the hackathons that Jack was just outlining. And so we have slides, uh, 10 hours of YouTube videos. And also there's actually virtual machines that you can download with QMC pack and quantum espresso and Pi CF all ready to run um, at this uh, GitHub link. And you see I put in an older scaling plot. So scaling, you know, the, these methods can be made uh, to scale with work on uh, the large machines. So what is our, our, our challenge? Well, of course we want to run, probably like everybody at this workshop, we want to run on our laptop all the way through to the largest machines. So I'm showing, you know, some of the upcoming GPU powered machines uh, on, from the sort of DOE perspective, but of course there are large multi-core uh, machines in Asia that the code um, would also like to be able to run uh, very efficiently on without large porting efforts. So Pearl Mutter is here now. And of course this has N NVIDIA A100 uh, GPUs. Um, in this uh, coming year, the installation will begin for um, the Aurora machine with uh, Intel Z GPUs. And um, uh, installation already started uh, this year of the Frontier machine at Oak Ridge with AMD uh, GPUs. Uh, and so of course we've got very different hardware from different vendors, very different maturity of hardware and software stacks. We want to be able to run on all, all of these uh, productively, basically as soon as the machines uh, hit the floor. So then we you know what is our challenge? What are we trying to solve here? What we're after is a performance portability. So a very common code base between all the platforms so that it doesn't take very long to get up to speed uh, on these uh, new machines. And our challenge, as I, as I pointed out a slide or two ago, is not so much scaling. This actually took a lot of work. This doesn't happen automatically in quantum Monte Carlo, but it is less work than, let's say, a quantum chemistry application. Um, our challenge is not so much the scaling, but getting really high single node performance. And of course, we want to retain the freedom to use any specialized hardware uh, on these uh, machines. So suppose somebody implemented one of our key compute kernels in their hardware, we would certainly want to be able to, to call it. So we need that freedom, but at the same time, the performance uh, portability. Now, we actually have quite a bit of experience adapting to uh, new architectures. Uh, here I'm showing on the left the uh, work done for the uh, many core nights landing and here on the right some work for uh, GPUs and there's publications associated with these. So one thing I want to note here of course is that uh, updates can deliver a significant performance on CPUs as well. We need to focus on uh, all architectures. Uh, so this is published in this SC17 uh, proceedings done by uh, Intel, Argon and Sendia. And what is shown here is uh, the normalized uh, time to solution. So this is for a box of nickel oxide 32 atom supercell, the original code taking a time of one and roughly doubling in performance, same also for a larger cell, 64 atoms. Sometimes it was also even, even greater speed ups were obtained. Uh, what was done 
Well, a lot of uh, roof line and also memory usage uh, analysis, as, as Jack was just hinting at, but also changes of data structures, make sure the application would vectorize much better, and also some strategic use of mixed precision uh, in the application. This had the side effect, actually, of improving the speed on all CPUs, which is uh, very nice. And one thing I'd like to note here about the extent of the work required, you know, it didn't, it didn't stop when this paper was done, and we actually only really fully completed a transition to this new version, so to speak, about two years later. So there was a lot more work to port the full set of functionality because we were a multi hundred thousand line uh, application and little updates were needed all over in some places much larger. So then what about GPUs? Well, QMC Pack has been running with CUDA on GPUs uh, for some time now. And this was you know, the, the, the key paper uh, done by uh, Ken Esler. And this shows here the speed up actually versus a quite now, uh, now quite old quad core CPU um, for various calculations, you know, small diamond calculation to a larger cell with much more, more many more electrons. Uh, so that's what controls the cost of our calculation, the electron count really. And the key realization here, and so this is the major algorithmic change was in order to have kernels that are large enough and to get the number of operations that we need to saturate GPUs, even, even back then, uh, let alone today's ones, we have to have an algorithm that can work, well, that's a batched algorithm and works on groups of walkers, Monte Carlo walkers or Markov chains simultaneously. So you see then they went up to 256, for some smaller problems with flow electron counts, we might do many thousands uh, today. And this is really the key step to getting enough uh, work uh, on the GPU. And I'll note though, that you know, we still keep this around as like an, it's like an independent internal fork inside the code. So there's some commonalities, but not as many commonalities as we would like. So we didn't get to the common code base uh, at least shortly after this GPU version. So we had limited functionality. So then how can we learn what a new version, a new architecture of the code should look like? Well, one of the ways to do this was, was to write a, a mini app. So we wrote a small version of uh, Quantum Monte Carlo. And the idea here is that you have a program that's in our case, it was freshly written. Um, well, actually we have both freshly written and cut down versions um, that encodes the key operations and is easier to change, more malleable, than the main application. So one can try out different things much more readily than in the main application. So for example, one can try OpenMP, one can try Cocos, one can do a direct CUDA port, for example, and see what these feel like, whether the features that one needs are available. And this is something I would certainly uh, recommend. So this just shows some uh, results for a sort of a 500 atom problem running in the mini app. And here lower is better on the Y axis. And here we have just running on various CPUs, ARM, Knight's Landing, and a, and a Xeon. Um, this also we've experimented with the batching, which we'll come back to. Um, one note, notice that you know even at the time, ARM was actually doing quite performing quite competitively. And then here on the right, we have you know the GPU uh, version, and we see the improvement uh, in batching as one would would expect. One thing that actually surprised me was just the utility of batching even in the CPU version, not necessarily for every architecture. So we see that you know, the Xeon is very strong uh, out, out of the box, but for some others, there's much more uh, improvement. So that was something that at least I learned from these uh, mini app uh, experiments. And one thing I would note, we also learned that there are multiple ways that we could write uh, QMC packs. So there were you know, different these different options here, and actually there are others, many are actually viable. The challenge is to have the right architecture for the code. So it's difficult to describe all the changes uh, in you know, just a short talk. So I'm gonna sort of give a quick uh, sketch here. So you know, what, what are the key things going into the new uh, architecture? Well, the first thing here is that we're going to be able to support, we have to support batching universally. And this implies large scale changes to the application. We, you know, whereas we couldn't put this off and we'd have to do it. So that's a lot of work. Um, that actually shows up in the various function call signatures and APIs, but you know, also going on, we have much better thought out ownership of the data, uh, the lifetime of data, what the APIs are. 
And one thing we have put in, and this is necessary for the performance portability part, is to have some flexibility in how the various computer operations are executed. So we have some flexibility to use OpenMP offload or maybe a direct CUDA implementation or DBC++, for example, if it really looks to be worth a while. And there's some logic for asynchronousity here and so on as well, which is also key. One thing I, I can't show here is that we're explicitly managing our data movement. So this gives us the greatest control, but adds a lot of uh, complexity. Um, and one thing I'll note as a result of this restructuring and rethinking, of course, it also makes it much easier to write and have much more comprehensive tests on the application. And that's also key when it comes to having collaborations and non-subject specialist work on the code. So just this one example here, you know, we have a sort of a high level application and then we have a sort of an abstract diffusion quantum Monte Carlo driver, for example, and it isn't contaminated with any implementation specific. So it's quite abstract. It knows about working on an ensemble of walkers and we can just have one of these drivers written. For example, we don't need different versions of this for each vendor. And then of course there's various abstractions. So here pieces of wave function. And then somewhere, let's suppose we're evaluating orbitals, which have been splined. You know, we have a function called to evaluate them. And then we have an API, which involves multiple walkers all the way through. So this is the batching. And then somewhere down here, you have the freedom to use a blocked algorithm if that would work well on the specific architecture. And we're very fortunate that um, basically a single choice or very few choices are going to work well broadly. Uh, we also actually made one more change from the, the CUDA scheme. So this is also something that we learned and proved out uh, in the mini app. Uh, and this is a ways of actually getting best, better utilization, better asynchronicity uh, overall. And I've tried to, to sketch this uh, here. So one potential problem of just launching huge amounts of work to the GPU is that if you then have to wait for that result and then do some GPU work, a CPU work, for example, if you've done a very large amount of batching, that may take a while for that CPU um, to, run, to run through, do that work before launching the next uh, kernel. Uh, and so you can have various bottlenecks occur this way, because while this is running in this sort of example, the GPU is not busy and that's where all the performance is. So what we've done is to subdivide our groups of walkers into crowds, so that's the new terminology. And so here we're gonna have two crowds in the sketch driven by two, two threads. And here in this example, we, you know, if we have one uh, crowd, we launch a huge chunk of work onto the GPU, which I'm proposing that four blocks you know, fully saturates it. So that has to run, then we have to run again. Uh, but if we have two crowds, you know, we can launch this work and maybe the second thread, of course, it can put the work in the queue, but it's not going to start. Right? When this first chunk of work finishes, which I said fills the GPU, so when this finishes, this next one can, um, can, can start, but in the meantime, the CPU can do uh, some work. And then if one works this out, you see that when, depending on, uh, you know, the other work that we have to do, you, we can potentially get a higher throughput. One can also do things like hide uh, memory transfers uh, through this as well. Of course, it's very use case and hardware dependent, but it's an extra flexibility we put in and a change from the past. So what's the performance? And it's important to note, you know, this is very much a, a work in progress, but, it, you know, this is right up on GitHub, so you can see and, and you know, run this uh, directly. So what I'm plotting here is performance on um, Volters for convenient. That's sort of our, our reference uh, here. And this is a 256 atom problem and a 512 atom problem. And as, as Jack said, we'd like to run uh, even larger. This is relative throughput. And as a rough reference, we're using the performance of the old design implemented with CUDA. And I want to note here, this is not an apples to apples comparison because we have algorithmic changes in the new new design as well. So for example, the old design always, in this case, would always recompute neighborless. It would do it a little bit too often. Um, now we're careful to move them around and to minimize some of that uh, recomputation. So that's the difference which affects uh, performance. But we see, yes, for the large problems, we are finally able to overtake. So that's something we're sort of celebrating. But for the smaller problems still, you know, we have this gap. 
Uh, what is this uh, due to? Well, it's essentially down to the humans. We have more work to do, still getting more work uh, on the GPU, whereas the old, old design and CUDA version already has uh, running there, such as a structure factor, uh, for example. And so, of course, one of the interesting questions will be, how close can we get as um, you know, I would actually like to get over this rough reference bar for this 256 atom uh, example. So that's our current performance and I'll note here we have to use the development version of the Clang LLVM compiler to do this so we're using you know really latest uh, OpenMP uh, implementations currently. So just some notes here you know what you know why are we going going through all of this besides you know the straight performance well we're talking about computation here, but you know, really we're here to do science. And we're hoping that this really unlocks improved scientific productivity, because if we have a common source code that can run everywhere without too much effort, just initially, then that's gonna let us get on and doing our science. And then we can do later optimization as warranted. And of course, with the improved architecture and testing, it's easier to bring in, for example, someone working at a particular supercomputer center to do some custom uh, optimization because we have a much cleaner design, much se cleaner separation of concerns uh, than before. And because of that separation of concerns, it's easier to now add and subtract in uh, different tools. And we often, and libraries and some, we often talk about adding them, but of course we also want to drop older things as part of maintaining the health uh, of the application. So I know there's a few questions. I'm gonna wrap up here in a minute, but, um, we just have a sort of few outstanding uh, questions that we want to answer. I'm going to raise them here because otherwise, you know, they're going to be asked in a moment, which is, of course, how close to native performance will be achieved you know, using only portable code on whatever one's favorite platform is. And we're actually pretty confident we're not going to need very much of this. Uh, but, you know, the, I would say, you know, come back and ask us later in 2022, because we're soon going to have access to uh, powerful GPUs from you know three different vendors as well as the range of multi-core architectures. So instead of saying you know I think we'll be able to do this, we'll be able to have actual data showing you know just how far we've gotten. Of course, we can run on these GPUs uh, today, but there's much more work uh, to be done. So then, just to summarize, you know the takeaway here is don't overlook the software architecture. Do spend uh, appropriate time on this. Uh, because it's really key to unlocking the potential of really all these uh, future architectures. And there are a lot of good uh, side effects. So if you choose wisely here, I think you'll be doing your future self uh, a great favor. So on that note, thanks very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Um, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? They, again, you can raise your hand or ask it to through the chat, okay. Oh, that's a long question. Tibor asks, what is your take on CPUs entering the gigabyte cache era? And this is in context with AMD having their new Epic CPUs with large caches and large memory. Thank you for the question. Um, so, of course, there are, as I pointed out, CPUs are continuing uh, to uh, evolve, and uh, you know I think it's it's great to see this this change. Uh, one thing I learned through the, from working on the Exascale Computing Project is just the breadth of different scientific algorithms that there are. So I think you know this is a this is a, I've shown that we can map Quantum Monte Carlo to GPUs and we already won, ver, run very well on CPUs. So for example, the petaflop was done on the Blue Waters machine when that was first uh, installed. So this might help us, but I think it's very exciting to people who you know, don't have all that sort of blocked vector work uh, that one really needs to map to GPUs. So I think this is great to see. Then Alvredo asks, what is the position of QMC pack on using frameworks at all now or in the future? Excellent question from uh, Alfredo. So, you know, we're, we want to deliver a code that lets us and all the users do science productively. And the ideal thing here, as Jack was, you know, hinting at is that we can use you know, methods that have been standardized because they have become popular and been successful. 
And one of the benefits of carefully thinking through the code architecture and trying to separate out the dependencies and isolate them a bit is that it makes the cost of transitioning to something new much lower. So, um, you know, in the event something we've chosen here, you know, doesn't work out, we will be able to move uh, to it. I don't think we will have to do that, but we have that flexibility uh, built in. So we'll see. We would certainly like to, for example, migrate to using standardized C++, but it, I think it's much too early uh, to use that. If you look at the number of applications you're really using that in anger, it's a very, very short list. Hopefully in a few years. Okay, I think we're at time. So I would say thank you again, Paul, for a great talk and also uh, answering the, the questions.